Hello everyone and welcome back to the channel. I am sorry that I am not making a systems design video this week. To be honest, uh, I really just can't find the motivation. Like, <laughs> I went to Vegas this past weekend and went and got hammered and then I came back and I was like a couple days behind schedule and I was just like, Jesus Christ, dude. The last thing that I would want to do is go make a video about how to build a job scheduler. And it's not because I don't like want to help people or anything, I do, but I've just already done it so much that I feel like it's starting to get monotonous. And additionally, at the same time, I feel <clears throat> lucky enough and blessed enough that there are other random coding bullshit problems that are on my mind because that's just kind of how I work. And I, I feel like I'd rather spend my time thinking about them because they're all really interesting to me. So I don't really plan on doing any coding today. Uh, I'll probably start it in like a week or two. Um, but I think I will hopefully give a little bit of an insight into why I'm thinking about the problems that I am and kind of some of the, the BS that I hope that uh, I can solve with a little bit of a side project. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Okay, so it's time to talk about table formats a little bit and why they've been making me extremely angry recently. Well, I'm working with uh, Iceberg a little bit at work and obviously I'm not gonna go into what I'm doing too much because I can't, but the gist is Iceberg is just pissing me off generally. So before I can really explain why it's pissing me off, I kind of have to explain what Iceberg is. I've made a video about it on this channel, but I don't expect everyone to have watched it. And even if you did, I'm sure a refresher can be useful anyway. So like I've said a couple of times on here, I work in the data space, right? So when you work in the data space, probably 90% of that just means you've got a bunch of parquet files, right? Like these guys right here, and you're storing them on some sort of object store, like this guy right here. And the idea is that, you know, prior to any sort of table format, typically what you would do is you would organize your files in just like certain directories, right? So that you would know for a given partition, you just put all of the files in that directory. And that's one way of organizing your files, but you know, what if you want to change how things are structured and, or you want to rename things or something like that, or you want to repartition. Now all of a sudden you have to move a bunch of files around, which is like an expensive operation. It's not trivial to do that at all. So I mean, Iceberg comes around as like a pretty simple metadata system, right? What it allows you to do is basically have a metadata file like this one, like I have in green. And all that metadata file is doing is really just pointing to a bunch of different data files on S3, which actually contain the data of your table. So if I have a bunch of customer data or something, that's what I'm looking at right here. All of this stuff is just nicely contained for me, which is really, really convenient. Now another feature that Iceberg in particular boasts is immutability. So not only are the data files immutable, Right? And that's generally always kind of been the case for Parquet. Like it's never expected that you can just like go on an object store and modify Parquet files, but also the metadata files are immutable. So if, if this guy is my old metadata file right here, if I wanna add this new data file in green, I actually have to completely copy this and modify it to add one extra pointer over here to the new data file in green. Then I make that as my new table metadata file. And then the last part of Iceberg or Delta Lake or Hootie is that you have this concept of something known as a catalog, which just sits right here and basically waits for you to change the current metadata file. And then you make some API requests to the catalog to go do that. And then you know now all of a sudden the catalog is pointing to your new metadata file. So any readers in the future are gonna go to your catalog, say, oh, what's the current metadata file? The catalog's gonna tell them, you're gonna read the metadata file. And then from there, you know, now all of a sudden you're gonna read all these data files, which is gonna make life pretty easy, right? Because it's very easy to tell where everything is. The nice thing about having all of these immutable metadata files is that you can do something known as time travel, right? So if I'm in Iceberg and I just like screw up randomly, you know, maybe this file is pointing to this data file, which is corrupted, or it doesn't exist or something like that, and my metadata is bad. I know that this metadata also has a pointer to the previous metadata. And so all of a sudden, I can just go ahead and point my catalog to go right back to the previous metadata, and it's like this file never even got added. Another nice thing about having this immutable metadata is it means that when I add a bunch of files, everything is atomic in my system. So I could even add another data file down here and readers are not gonna see the existence of that data file nor its presence until I actually go and update the metadata up over here. So Iceberg has a lot of things that it's boasting, but it also does a lot of things that really piss me off personally. For starters, like I said, everything is immutable. That's a pro and a con. Right? It means that every single time I want to commit a write, even if it's a single row of data, I have to go add yet another metadata file, which points to it. I have to rewrite all the metadata in that file, and that's not insignificant either. There could be a lot of it. And then I have to go to this catalog thingy over here and get it to point to my new metadata file. And that's really annoying, right? Like, 
If you think about it, in every sort of systems design video that we've discussed up to this point, we've always basically said that if we have metadata for objects that are stored in S3, it wouldn't be in a bunch of separate files, it would just be in a database. Because a database is really fast, you can do single row updates, and it's just going to allow you to see the state of the world. And so basically it seems like the creators of these table formats were like big data warehouse guys or big data lake guys. We're very familiar with object stores and things like that. But for whatever reason, we're extremely biased against the database. And this inherently means that the number of commits that you can actually make to this table, especially small ones, is fairly limited because every single time that you make an even arbitrarily small commit, you now all of a sudden have to go right over here and it stinks. And you know the thing about just using a normal database is that obviously that's gonna be row oriented and we want all these parquet files which are column oriented. We want them to be in S3 because that is um, object store so it's basically infinitely scalable. So you don't really have to worry about scaling things out. And you know the problem with databases is that they aren't infinitely scalable. You have to go do partitioning. You have to go replicate things. These are local attached disks, so you can't just like rely on a cloud provider to do everything for you. I mean, to some extent you can, right? Like you can go ask Amazon for, for DynamoDB or whatever and just pay them a ton of money to make it work. But I guess the point is that kind of leads us to this next generation of table formats, right? So enough people have used these and gotten upset with them that recently I've seen another one pop around, which is called Duck Lake. So Duck Lake is fairly interesting. I can't remember if it's from the creators of DuckDB, but it's definitely associated it with one way or another. And the idea is that Duck Lake is basically doing everything that I complained about, right? So Duck Lake is going to just have like, you know, a list of files and, you know, some file metadata in a single database row. And the beauty of that is that, you know, if this database that gets used as the Duck, uh, Duck Lake catalog is just Postgres, that means that we could do ACID transactions right here, right? So instead of being scared that you know I can't throw down multiple different uh, data files at the same time, I totally can, and then I just add multiple rows atomically to my database catalog. So you can see that Duck Lake actually does a lot of really nice stuff, which is really, really cool. Now, in addition to Duck Lake, which I do think is an improvement on Iceberg, though it's also fairly new and hasn't really gathered as much popularity yet, I read another article recently which encounters a bunch of other issues, right? So in Iceberg, like I mentioned, every single thing is an immutable parquet file. And so the problem with that is that, you know, to actually go ahead and delete data, you can basically rewrite the entirety of a data file right here and just remove, let's say, I don't know, this chunk of it. But rewriting parquet files is actually quite expensive, right? So, you know, me rewriting this whole thing without this one region right here is going to take me a very long time and it's going to involve a lot of work. So basically all of these table formats now have invented yet another style of file called a delete file. And a delete file is basically indicating which rows or which parts of a file or you know like logically which rows of a database are no longer considered valid. So that way instead of having to rewrite a bunch of parquet files whenever you want to delete rows, which would take a really long time, you first write a delete file and then maybe you've got some sort of um, you know like background compaction job. And what the background compaction job is going to do is eventually it's going to merge the delete files and the data files that it applies to so that it can rewrite all of those data files without those rows. It's going to speed up the time that it takes for you to read the actual parquet data, which is really good. But you know, to me, this is starting to kind of be an anti-pattern, right? Like a lot of people are using these delete files as a pretty big crutch. Um, and at the end of the day, like ultimately, if you want to be able to quickly delete rows, there are just going to be certain data structures that are better for that, right? There are systems that actually have rows on their local disk and can do this a lot more efficiently. For example, you know, another database. So if people have started to do it again, believe it or not, the absolute audacity is go take this Postgres database, right? Put a bunch of data in it. And this is going to allow them to do a bunch of quick, you know, column based uh, edits, deletes, things like that, all the stuff that they couldn't do efficiently in Iceberg or Hootie or Delta or whatever. And now they're going to start federating reads. So federating means basically unioning data or combining data between a bunch of sources. So if you have something like Trino right here, all you're doing is going from Trino and you're reading this Postgres database, which keep in mind is not at all tracked by your Iceberg table. And then you're also reading your Iceberg table and like going to the catalog, getting the metadata pointer and doing the rest of that. And the fundamental issue with this 
is that now all of a sudden you've got this Postgres database which isn't tracked by your catalog and you know, you've just got no protections there. Someone can evolve this schema, they can drop a bunch of data that's supposed to be in your table, blah, 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 and it's not good. And so basically we've created a new issue which is that you know, we have all of these hybrid tables where hybrid table basically just means you have an OLTP or row-oriented database combined with an OLAP uh, data lake, so a bunch of parquet files. And there's no good way to really wrangle, the, wrangle all of those together, right? Because the original point of all of this metadata was so that you can keep track of all of your data. And now what's happening is that all of a sudden now we have this second source of data. And the nice thing about a data lake as well is that, you know, not only can Trino read it like pretty trivially by just hooking up to it, but you also want, you know, Spark to be able to read it, uh, you want Flink to be able to read it, you want Presto to be able to read it, you want Dremio to be able to read it. And so you have one table format that basically any of these guys know and understand. And so the second you start federating like this so that you can do fast updates, oh, guess what? All of a sudden, nothing can read your data anymore. So what do I want to work on? Well, pretty simply, I do actually really like the idea and design of Duck Lake. I think it's very smart to just go back to using a database for holding metadata. I feel like that was the right idea all along. That being said, one thing that you don't get with Duck Lake, presumably, is time travel, right? So because I'm using a Postgres database here, when I actually overwrite data or I overwrite metadata, like it's immutable or it's mutable rather. I, I can't just like go in time and see the prior state of my table. Maybe Duck Lake has some sort of way of solving this where they keep writes around for a little bit, uh, but I'm not sure and it might balloon the size of the table that they're holding. I would like to solve this problem as well and I think it's very possible to do so. Um, another thing that I would like to do is solve the problem of not only making sure that we're using a database and you know we have this concept of time travel, but I also want to be able to make sure that we can solve the problem of these federated tables. I don't think that Parquet is the solution for all the data. It's getting pretty ridiculous that everyone is trying to use Parquet for everything. And now that's kind of the problem that I'm running into in work is that we're trying to Frankenstein together what's effectively a transactional process using iceberg delete files and iceberg just can't keep up with the write load there and the concurrency. So instead we should really be you know, using something like Postgres here and having our catalog point to both of these things. And that way we'll at least have metadata management by virtue of one single catalog. But you know, it really even should go beyond Postgres, right? Because not only are we you know, using databases to store data, guess what everyone also uses to get data into their actual tables themselves is Kafka, right? So I've got Kafka and then eventually it's going into S3 probably by virtue of some other process which is ingesting Kafka and you know, maybe it's uh, buffering and it's creating parquet files and it's writing them into S3 itself. This could be Flink, for example. Flink is pretty popular of a choice to ingest into iceberg tables. But the point is, you know what? Some people want their data available so quickly, maybe they actually want to be reading from Kafka too. And mo most importantly, when I put data from Kafka into S3, that should be a transaction, right? Like I should be making it so that the offset that I'm reading in Kafka is corresponding to an offset or a timestamp in my iceberg table. So at the end of the day, basically the idea is to unify uh, your transactional database, it's to unify Kafka, it's to unify your actual table format themselves. And the whole point is this should also be easily readable with very, very little configuration between all of these different engines, right? You choose one schema that you know applies to all of this data that is very reasonable, and then you have a single engine that can easily read it back together. I don't think this is gonna be an easy undertaking. I don't really plan on doing anything that crazy with it, but I do also have some initial implementation details in my head that I think get me a decent amount of the way there just as a proof of concept. So I'm very excited to start running through it with you guys. Um, this has been something that I've thought about a lot lately, and it's mostly just completely motivated by the fact that these are problems I encounter in my day-to-day -day life. Like I sit here, complain about Iceberg all day, and I'm like, God, I really wish I had this thing that, <laughs> you know, I want to go and build because it's just not working for me. So anyways, guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's all very abstract and I think I'll be doing a lot more writing in the near future to actually explain what I'm talking about. Um, this if really, if nothing else, is just a primer and because I wanted to make a video this week and I'm too lazy to do a systems design one. But uh, nonetheless, I hope it's interesting. For those of you who do work in the data space, I imagine this may be uh, a problem that you've faced before. And, uh, you know, I'm excited to uh, at least try and tackle it a little bit. So 
I will see you guys very soon.